morning. morning. Will you pray with me? Uh, Lord, what a great transition. I want to make the time between what we just sang and what I pray so short. Let us take you at your word. This is a church that believes in your word, is living and active, is authoritative, inerrant, infallible. We love your word. We sit at your feet this morning. We ask you to be our teacher, and we do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have really enjoyed this series we've been in, Scriptures That Shape My Faith, and I just want to hit you with the one that I'm going to preach on this morning right on the gates. You ready? It's from 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It reads like this. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This Scripture is so foundational because it talks about the nature of Scripture itself. Even the briefest look shows its force. It says all Scripture, Genesis to Revelation, not just the Scriptures I agree with, not just the Scriptures I even am aware of. In the, the, sometimes you read stuff that you feel like, that's really in there? I've had that experience. Maybe you have. All Scripture. And it's God-breathed. It's authoritative um, in how it is, has its force on us. And it's useful for all of the different aspects of the Christian life. For teaching. It's the thing that ought to shape what we believe about our lives and about the world and matters of salvation over and above tradition and reason and human experience. It has to come above our intuitions and gut feelings. It even has to come above culture and things we hear on the news. Scripture has to be the driving force that teaches us. And because it will do that, it will invariably rebuke and correct us. It will stand against aberrant and heretical teachings. And it does all of that because it wants to train us in righteousness so that the servant of God is thoroughly equipped for every good work. I can't tell you how thankful I am to be in a church that believes this and supports this. That each and every week as we stand up and we open God's word, we put this into practice. And this is the kind of verse that really has sent me on my life's mission. I read this a long time ago now as a young teenager, and I wanted to know all Scripture, and it has sent me on the adventure of a life. But when you really want to know all Scripture, things can be difficult. And so today, um, I want to take you on uh, this journey that I've been on, on the command to know all Scripture. And part of that sent me to seminary. So I had the great idea that four years into being married, Katie and I would go across the country to Pasadena, California, to go to a uh, evangelical seminary. And we almost died along the way, literally with like, in the, that's a story for another time. But about 10 minutes into our journey, we had to like pull over, switch cars, go the next day. It was harrowing. If you ever want to take me to coffee and hear that story, I'd be glad to receive that. Okay. So we go, and when I arrived on campus, I got this advice. Don't pick the course, pick the professor. And I was like, that's weird. I had been so used to picking the course. My undergrad was in um, public health, natural sciences. Med school was where I was going. I became a pastor by accident, and here I am. 20-some years later, and it's, uh, I think it might have been on purpose. But um, I, I was so used to checking the boxes, I never like cared professor. I thought about classes I needed to be in med school. And so I was like, I'll, I'll try that. And so I asked around my first week on campus, and people said, you have to take a course from Dr. David Scholler. And I was like, amazing. And they said, but you just got to know, and this is morbid, he has terminal cancer, he's going to die very soon, so you better jump on it. No matter what the course is, you take it. I was like, okay, I really felt like led, like this is what I needed to do. And so I raced in to sign up for whatever class he taught. And guess what class it was? Women, the Bible, and the church. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. I don't want to take a class on that. I went into seminary and I did not know a lot. If you would have asked me when I went into that class, the reason why I was so like, I don't want to take this is because I had a very strong opinion on that. If you would have asked me, can women preach, teach, and lead in the church? I would have said, no. Ironically, years later, God would call me to this church, who since its inception, long before I got here, has called women to teach and preach and lead in the church. And, but at that time, I would have been like, no. And if you would have asked me why I thought that, I would have said, because the Bible. And if you would have asked one more follow-up question, where, I would have gone, ah, you're breaking up. I can't quite hear you. I got to go. Because at that point, I was opinionated, but uninformed. And that is a dangerous recipe for uh, having opinions, because opinions are very easy to come by. You get to just decide. But this course, the reason why I like hung in there, because I was like, I don't want to take this. I can't believe the only course 
I'm going to get to take from this legend before he dies is women, the Bible, and the church. The reason why I hung in there is because baked into the course was 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. The guiding principle was what does all Scripture say about this? It wasn't about different opinion pieces. It wasn't about different positions you could hold. It says, let's look at all Scripture and see what all Scripture says. And for that, I was ready for. I was so excited and it was excruciating. Thousands of pages of reading. Trying to read both sides of this argument. Because, by the way, and again, I hate to like burst your bubble. Did you know Christians sometimes disagree on things? I know if that was like, there'll be a prayer in the back if that's a new thing for you, like that we disagree. Did you know we disagree on things like politics? Oh my gosh, can you believe that, right? Again, sorry if I'm the bearer of bad news. But Christians, God-loving, Bible-reading, Christians disagree on this issue. But this course said, let's look at all Scripture. Because again, going into this course, I was opinionated, but I would say uninformed. If you really pressed me, I wouldn't really know. I just trusted what I thought other people that I respected thought. But I never really did the work myself. And I've come to the conclusion, man, to develop a robust opinion on something just takes an enormous amount of work. But this was all Scripture, so I was in. And I want to go and take you just on a little all Scripture journey this morning, the same one I took 20 years ago. That was the first time I looked at an issue in that degree of depth. It just so happens it's women, the Bible, and the church. And so I'd like to take you on that. So when I get to the end of the sermon, you're going to think one thing. You're going to think, Adam just preached a, a sermon on women, the Bible, and the church. And I will have kind of. But my bigger hope is that you will be inspired to look at all Scripture and see all Scripture as God breathed and be willing to hang in there. And when you want to think something consequential, that you would look at all Scripture. This church is designed around people who value that, that all Scripture is God breathed, and we would form our opinions on Scripture, not on our intuitions or not on even culture and all the things it says. My hope is by the end of it, that of course I've preached on this particular issue, but that I would have also put a fire in your chest for the Word of God. That you would see the Word of God, all Scripture, as sweeter than honey to your lips. That it would, you would love its teaching and revelation. That you would meditate on it day and night. That it would be a lamp under your feet and a light unto your uh, uh, path. That it would be bread that feeds your soul, water that slakes your thirst, and a balm that heals your soul. And that you would be interested in knowing the whole counsel of God. Exactly what we preach on here, week in and week out. And you would live by it as authoritative, inerrant, and infallible as the revelation to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so the question on the table this morning is the same one I was forced to ask because of God's sovereignty and plan that I found my way into a course I didn't want to take um, and would be called into a church that I wouldn't have agreed with couple of, uh, you know, 20 some years ago, is when we look at all scripture, who do we see leading and teaching in all scripture? And do we see women leading and teaching men and women in all scripture? I'm indebted to the work of so many people for the sermon, Dr. David Scholler, this guy, Nijay Gupta, uh, Pastor Wu- Susie Silk, so many others. But let's ask that question. And we need all scripture, so we're going to keep it brisk today. Are you with me? Can you hang in there? I have your like, you know, thinking caps on. We're going to look at All scripture, we can't read the Bible cover to cover uh, in this setting. So we're going to look at creation, Israel, Jesus, the early church, and Revelation. And that will cover pretty much all scripture. So you ready? Let's go. First, Genesis. Start in verse 27 of chapter 1. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them. Verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Right out of the gates, we see that God created mankind, and that's a placeholder for both sexes in his image because he later says he created them male and female. And those two complementary pieces, two distinct sexes, are equally called to all the work that needs done in the garden. That they together are supposed to be fruitful and increase in number because, by the way, if it was just one of them, by themselves, they could not fulfill that command. And in that list of commands he gives them, it seems obvious, be fruitful and increase in number, you need each other to do that. Fill the earth and subdue it, and then rule over it. And so, 
Genesis 1, right out of the gates, you see these complementary pieces coming together without hierarchy to work towards God's commands. Genesis 2 retells the story. And on this scene, it tells a little bit, it luxuriates in the account rather than just telling you. It says that Adam was created first. He's created out of the ground. God makes that little dust pile, breathes into it, and you get Adam. And God put him to work. He's working in the garden. Things are growing. He gives him the command, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then as he's seeing this, it's, he says, despite Genesis 1 saying, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. Genesis 2 says, as Adam is alone, it's not good. He needs a helper suitable for him. And he is meant to sweat it out for a while. God wants him to feel the void that he has. They bring forth all the animals one by one. Are any of these helpers suitable for you? None of them are. So God puts them to sleep, takes a rib, makes woman, brings them to Adam, and he says, oh, woman, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, this is the best. And then the next thing they say, the very next thing is, this is why a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and cling to her. That's the very next thing. So ironically, if you were to ask me to preach a sermon on a biblical view of marriage and sexuality, I would start in the same place. These two complementary pieces, distinct sexes that come together to accomplish what God wants to happen. So he needs a helper, helper suitable. That's what God's trying to make him. And it's a phrase in the Hebrew, and I know you all know this, but I'll tell you anyways. The Hebrew is Azer Konegdo. That first word Azer means helper. And in fact, I didn't uh, always know this. It's a military term. It has a force to it. It's the kind of help that Israel asks for when they're in a battle. And they need help. They don't need subservient help. They don't need somebody who's less than them. They need somebody that can stand shoulder to shoulder and tackle this enemy. Of course, Adam needs this kind of help for you know, what we could talk about the battle of life, but they will face evil itself. And they will fail together, but they will have to work towards being a team working against the curse as far as it is found. And so God wants him to have this kind of help. Again, oftentimes when Israel asks for help, it comes as a nation to help them. But most of the time, it's God. It's a kind of term used for divine assistance. And what's amazing is this kind of military theme is sometimes hid. And that it is this peer-to-peer facing the battle of life together sometimes goes unnoticed. Let me tell you a surprising place where we see this. Because you might think like, well, why are we talking about a female help and this military term in the same sentence? Have you ever read Proverbs 31? It's this beautiful text about a godly wife. And in verse 10, it says this. It says, a wife of noble character who can find. She is worth more than rubies. Maybe you've gotten that in a greeting card. Maybe someone has just like said that over you. And it's a beautiful sentiment. But did you know that that phrase translated noble character, sometimes it's translated excellent. If you look it up in any sort of Hebrew grammar, it is a military term. It means force, strength, valor. Even in the book of Proverbs, when it says an excellent wife who can find, they mean someone who can stand shoulder to shoulder and tackle what God will bring them in this life. He needs help, but what kind of help does he need? He needs help that's connecto. It literally is translated like, but opposite. Like, opposite him. He needs someone that is equal to him in dignity and worth, and in the fact that they both bear the image of God, but he needs someone opposite him in sex so that they can be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and rule over it. In Eden, right out of the gates, you get this idea of complementarity without hierarchy. The idea of hierarchy, that one of those sexes is by creation superior than the other, happens in the fall. It's a result of the curse. You know that soon after this idyllic picture in the Garden of Eden, uh, Eve is deceived and they both eat from the tree that God said not to eat and God issues some covenants. I'm sorry, covenant issues some curses. And the curses take this shape. Everything that came from the other thing has that relationship fractured. Think about it. Humankind came from God. They have a fractured relationship. Adam came from that dust of the earth. And now what will the dust do? produce thorns and thistles and toil. Eve, as she brings new life into the world, will be marred by what? Pains in childbearing. 
And Adam and Eve, husband and wife, Eve that came from Adam, woman from man, will now have a fractured relationship. Well, what's the nature of their fractured relationship? Look at verse 16 of chapter 3. It says to the woman, he said, I'll make you pains, uh, make your pains and childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you'll give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will ro- rule over you. Where once it was marked by peer-to-peer, shoulder-to-shoulder help of one another, conquering all that God has asked them to conquer, now the temptation is that your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Let me remind you that this is part of the curse. So the question is, when Adam and Eve now, because of the curse, are tempted to undermine each other's uh, leadership, and specifically if you hack into the Hebrew, it's that the wife won't want to undermine her husband and the husband will want to respond by domineeringly leading his wife, um, that they need to potentially fight against that. We need to ask the question, is this what God wants or is this what is the temptation that needs to be fought against? And I think if you look at all the curses, just like Joy to the World says, that as far as the curse is found, we must make God's blessings flow. We must contradict the curse. Let me give you an example. Um, Now, uh, do you think God wants us to just relish in thorns and thistles and toil? No, when you spray Roundup on a weed, you're not disobeying the commands of God in Genesis. Now, if you looked at my yard, you'd think like, man, you really are into thorns and thistles, I bet, you know? You better work a little bit harder against that part of the curse. When a woman gets an epidural in childbirth, do you think she's disobeying what God wants? Of course not. It's a fight against the curse. And when husband and wife are tempted to undermine and domineer each other, it is part of the curse, not part of what God wants. So right out of the gates in Genesis, we see this complementarity between the sexes without hierarchy. That they're equally called and need each other desperately to stand shoulder to shoulder and tackle all that God wants them to tackle. Next, Israel. Do we see, who do we see leading in the nation of Israel? And do we see women leading both men and women? And the answer is yes, in every phase. We'll go quickly through this, but you can divide up Israel's history in at least five different phases. The first is Exodus. We spent a long time studying that book together as a church. The next is the period of the judges. Then there's the United Kingdom, the divided kingdom, and then the period of the prophets. And in every single one, you see women teaching and leading in the church. We read this in Exodus 15, after Israel crossed over the Red Sea, who leads the nation in worship? Moses and Miriam, side by side, leading the nation of Israel in worship. That's why we allow women worship leaders up here, because we see it as the biblical model. And additionally, in Numbers 12, Miriam is referred to as a prophet through whom the Lord spoke. So in Exodus, we see it. In the period of the judges, God didn't want kings when they came into the promised land. And so he called judges. There's local tribal leadership. And when the local tribal leadership couldn't solve a dispute, they went to the judge that was a God-ordained, God-picked person. Judges 4 tells us that who did God pick to be one of such of those judges? He picked Deborah. She sat and she presided. She spoke the rulings and judgments of God. She worked alongside a man named Barak. And Barak was one of the military heroes. And they had an army that they needed to conquer. And Deborah was the one who gave the command. Because Barak said, I won't go into battle unless you go with me. And it's this hysterical part of Judges 4 where she says, Hey, just did you hear what you just said? If I go into battle with you, a woman, not a man, will get the honor. And he said, That's fine. I won't go unless you tell me God said to do it. And sure enough, Barak waited until Deborah said, go. And they went into battle and they won the victory just as God had revealed to Deborah. And then in Judges 5, they actually make a song about it where Deborah gave the command for them to go into battle. In the United Kingdom, there's a wise woman named Abel who brokers a dispute between Joab and his potential sack of a city looking for a murderer. In the United, or in the divided kingdom, we see Huldah consulting and prophesying for King Josiah. King Josiah was one of the most beloved kings in the nation of Israel's history. He was one of the ones, he was one of the good guys that was leading the people back to God, not away from God. There were plenty of kings that led him away. Josiah wanted to lead them back. And when he had the option of asking both male and female prophets what to do, he chose Huldah, a female prophet, even when there were men prophets to ask. And in Esther, in the time of the prophets, Esther and Mordecai worked together 
to overthrow Persian law and institute the celebration of Purim each year. When you look at the nation of Israel and everything that happened in it and all of its different phases, you see men and women leading both men and women side by side, working against the hierarchy that the curse wants to slip in to the church. Those are five examples, but there's scores of other. You can take a snapshot of that, but we're going to take it down in a second because we've got to keep moving. Let's go. All right, next. Jesus, his birth, ministry, death, and resurrection. Now, by the time of Jesus, cultural influences have crept into the church. And that's another thing. Sorry to burst your bubble. Did you know sometimes culture creeps in? Did you know that? Where culture kind of has a say of the way it thinks things should work, and it creeps in even to our church? By this time, women were just assumed to be inferior. They couldn't testify in the court of law. And did you know that there was a prayer, famous Jewish prayer, prayed often by Jewish men, and where they thanked God that they were not a woman, a Gentile, or a slave. Now, if you know your Bible, you know that that sounds pretty much opposite of Galatians 3, 28, where in Christ there is no male or female, Jew or Greek, slave nor free. Kind of amazing. This is why you need to watch and guard your doctrine carefully. Because in the time of Jesus, culture had crept in. It was a cultural idea that people, religious people, were praying and thinking they were honoring God. They would say, God, thank you for not making me a woman or a Gentile or a slave. Amen. And they thought they were honoring God. It is one of the most clear and condemning examples of culture creeping into the church. And we as a church, need to stand guard against that still. Because did you know culture creeps? It wants to get a hold of your mind and your ideology, and it wants to even creep its way into your church. And you need to watch your doctrine carefully. And so Jesus, in this culture where people are thanking God they weren't made a woman, has women at every phase of his ministry. At his birth, it was Mary and Joseph, Elizabeth and Zechariah, Anna and Simeon, all prophesying. Jesus did choose 12 male disciples. That's incredibly true. Because Jesus was referred to as the new Moses. The 12 male disciples referred and mirrored the 12 tribes of Israel. No one would get it if it was any way different. And Jesus brings in the ultimate exodus from slavery to sin and death. But as soon as he called 12 male disciples, he immediately starts calling women equally um, as disciples who are made to disciple other people and make more disciples. And all the way from God's call to repent to his great commission, he involves women. And John 4, where does he go? Out of his way to Samaria, he meets a woman at the well. They talk shop, they talk theology, she gets saved. And what does he do? Does he say, go home and grab the nearest male you can before you spread the gospel? No, he says, go home and tell everybody, save your village. And what does she do? She goes, and men and women alike are led by her to Jesus' feet who he then saves them. In Luke 10, Mary and Martha are getting ready to host Jesus, and Martha takes a lo- or Mary takes a load off and sits at the feet of Jesus. This is a widely misunderstood passage. And Martha's like, I can't believe this. Like, are you honoring taking a load off? Like, we got work to do. And he says, no, Mary is doing the one thing that's necessary. And what was she doing? Sitting as a student and disciple at the feet of Rabbi Jesus, her teacher. He says the one thing and the one person really getting things right is the one that is sitting and learning as a disciple at my feet who happened to be Mary, a woman. In Luke 7, Jesus allows a sinful woman to anoint him. In Mark 5, Jesus allows an unclean woman with a bleeding disorder to touch him and commended her faith as exemplary. And Jesus rescues and calls adulterous women to salvation. And during his death and resurrection, all but John fled, but many women remained. They were there to take down Jesus' body, They visited the first tomb, and they are who the angels sent to tell the disciples. Now, I just want to be overly overt about this for a second, right? There is where Jesus was buried is called, you can go visit, well, you maybe couldn't visit it today. (laughs) I got to visit it uh, last April. It's called the garden tomb, right? Tomb's an important word, but so is garden. Have we talked about a garden yet today? Right? Garden of what? Garden of Eden. Awesome. They or find themselves in a garden. And a woman, Mary Magdalene, who used to be possessed by seven demons, sometimes referred to as seven devils, is the one who hears now the good news and is said to take it back to the male disciples. Can you think of any other garden 
where a woman was under the influence of a devil and ushered in something terrible. I sure can. I think we just talked about it. But now, Jesus is redeeming the curse that Eve ushered in. He now gives a woman, who used to be influenced by seven devils, the chance to tell the male disciples about the resurrection of Jesus so that men and women alike could lead shoulder to shoulder in a non-hierarchical way because everyone needed to be saved by the gospel. Jesus never did anything accidentally. He didn't come out of the grave and be like, oh, Mary, I was hoping for a dude. I can't believe this. You really caught me off guard. I guess I'll make the best of this. Jesus never did anything by accident. This was not an accident. He is undoing what happened in Genesis. He is working against the curse. He is working against hierarchy. And he is using a woman that was influenced by seven demons to get it done. It is striking. All throughout the ministry, the birth, the ministry, and the death and resurrection of Jesus, he uses women. Next, the early church. And the story is the same. Among that early church after Jesus ascends to heaven, among that 120 waiting for the Holy Spirit to fall on them was men and women. Because, do you know why? Because in the, in, in the prophet Joel, he said, on men and women, my spirit will fall. I will pour out my spirit on your sons and daughters. And they were prophecy. You know what prophecy is? It isn't just like, like I know who's going to win the Super Bowl in three years. Right? That's not prophecy. What prophecy is, is speaking the words of God. And he says, men and women, Women will do that when I pour out my spirit. And so men and women are gathered waiting at Pentecost for the Holy Spirit. Acts 5 tells us later that because of that, men and women were added to the number. And there are loads of specific examples. Priscilla and Aquila were a husband and wife team leading shoulder to shoulder, side by side. They met Paul in Corinth, fallen into Ephesus. They stayed there and they are the ones who taught Apollos, who Joel preached on a little bit ago, about the baptism of Jesus. He knew about John's. He didn't know about that of Jesus. They plant churches, they co-workers with Christ, and they both risk their lives for the gospel. Phoebe is a benefactor to the church, and Junia is also someone who Paul esteems as outstanding among the apostles. And there are many more. You can see the examples behind me. Paul's letters mention 12 women by name who are co-workers, three that lead house churches, and four that are described by this very specific phrase that they worked very hard to the gospel for the gospel. And lastly, this is the way that the new heavens and the new earth are oriented. See, in the book of Revelation, so we're starting Genesis, we're almost done with all scripture. It's just that easy, right? We're almost there. The book of Revelation points towards what's called the universal priesthood. Let me read it for you. Verse 9 in chapter 5 says, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons of every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests and what? They will reign. This was so fundamental and so important that this is one of the guiding principles of the Reformation. When the Protestant church broke away from the Catholic church, they, one of their guiding principles was the priesthood of all believers because they were guided by what? All scripture. And they parted ways And the biggest split the church has ever seen because they thought the Catholic church was what? Hierarchical. That they were allowing themselves to fall prey to what was the curse. That they had bishops and priests and archbishops and popes in this level ascending their way closer and closer to God. And the Reformation said, no, all are equally called. All are served and mediated by one mediator and their interactions with God. And it's Jesus Christ. A woman doesn't need to go to a man to find forgiveness, to find confession, and, and to find salvation in Jesus Christ. And it was guided. That's what launched the Protestant church that we are now beneficiaries of was one of those guiding principles of the priesthood of all believers because they wanted to undo the hierarchy that they saw creep into the church. We've been Genesis all the way to Revelation I just ask you, who do we see leading? I think it's quite clear that we see men and women leading together. But just in the few minutes we have left, if this was so obvious, why do people disagree about this? Why do good, Bible-believing, godly people see this differently? 
It's because in that all Scripture, we have to deal with all Scripture, and there are some, what I call, tougher texts. They require some explanation. The first is from 1 Corinthians 11. Now, this is in a broader discussion about women praying and prophesying in the church, but right out of the gates in 11.3, we read this. It says, but I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ. So far, so good. The head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. And you'd say, see, I knew it. You were wrong, Adam. That text right there, right? The head of woman is man. Now, we have to have a little discussion on what headship means, but we also largely need to know that this is an argument in triplet. It needs to have the same sort of logic and reasoning to take off, the, to, to be something that we can understand. And what we hear is, so far so good. The head of every man is Christ. Great. Now, I would like to say like, but does that mean the head of woman isn't Christ? I would say, priest of all believers, Jesus is the one true mediator in the book of Hebrews. I think Jesus Christ is the head of both man and woman. Okay, but then it says the head of woman is man. And now let's just jump to the last one. The head of Christ is God. Now, that is something that would be hierarchical. If head means hierarchical authority, then we've just introduced hierarchy into the Trinity. And that is a big no-no. You may not know this, but in the Second Council of Constantinople, that was ruled a heresy. The eternal subjugation of the Son to the Father. Any sort of hierarchy in the Trinity is heresy and was condemned hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And yet, for this to mean that because man is man, they are the hierarchical superior head of wife, you have to smuggle in subordinationism or the eternal subjugation of the Son to the Father, which is a big, big Trinitarian no-no. So I think in a text like this, you can see the challenge of reading all Scripture and reading it well. I don't know if you can feel that with me, but some of these texts you go like, that feels like it says one thing, and as we look into it, maybe it means something different. Because a few verses later, there's this radical statement of equality between the sexes. Just eight verses later, verse 11. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. So you have to watch that when you read a text out of context, you may lose its context. Imagine that, right? (laughs) Just said the most obvious thing I've said all morning. Now, the next. Why do people agree on this? Here's a second tougher text. 1 Timothy 2. It says, A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Now, one thing I'd say right out of the gates. In the light of our talk about hierarchy being introduced in the fall, we need to watch when we see words like authority. And what happened by this time is the church was wild. There were all sorts of influences being introduced. There were cults that prized women. There was temple prostitution, if you can believe that. I won't even go into that, but that's crazy. Um, And there were all sorts of aberrant theologies coming in. Women at that time didn't have the same access to education that men had. And in an unbiblical move, because again, you and I have read Exodus together, they introduced separations in the worship spaces between men and women. And so this was a statement about order in worship. And what they are saying is it will be tempting for a woman in light of this newfound freedom in Christ to just usurp authority just like I commanded not to do in the Garden of Eden. Just like the curse said you might be tempted to do, don't do that. And finally, the last tougher text, 1 Corinthians 14, says this, Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home. For it's disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Now, just for a minute, if we just took the plain reading of that, how dare you women sing earlier? If you follow this to the letter. Now, you might say, well, of course it doesn't mean that. Well, so what does it mean? If it doesn't mean silence, which it means, if it did mean, I don't know any church that follows this passage if it means what it looks like it means. Because if you were to follow this to the letter. One, it would contradict all of the discussions that have happened so far, even within this own book and with this own chapter, which is the context, about discussions of women praying and prophesying in the church with some authority. And if you follow this to the letter, do you know what you couldn't do? You couldn't pray. You couldn't prophesy. You couldn't sing. You couldn't read scripture. 
You couldn't shift in your seat, shuffle your feet, or even sneeze. You would have to remain silent because it's disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. So even for the tougher texts, as we look at the broad scope of Scripture, I believe that Scripture points in this direction. So when we ask the question, who do we see leading in the church? I think we see men and women, shoulder to shoulder, side by side, leading, because the task that God has called us to, to redeem his creation, is too big for one set of the sexes to do it. Now lastly, as we move towards communion, what is always said about this, almost always, is this a slippery slope? And when people say that, they have one fear in mind. They say, oh, with all this like, you know, equality stuff, does this mean that you're going soft on biblical sexuality? Does this mean then you have to embrace same-sex marriage? Let me just be very clear with you for a second. No. I would start in the same place that I started here to build a case for one man, one woman for life in marriage. I would go back to that complementarity without hierarchy. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is reunited or united to his wife. And they become one flesh and they cling to one another and conquer all that God has called them to. And then lastly, the other accusation, I've, I've had this said to my face and it's great. I love it. Love awkward interactions. They say like, well, you have to go soft on scripture to advance this point. I just have one question for you. Have I gone soft on scripture this morning? Do you think I've taken all scripture to be God-breathed? I think so too. Now here's the deal as we get to the end and move to, towards communion. You're going to walk away going, nice sermon on women, the Bible, and the church, right? And you're half right. Remember what I really wanted. Here's what I really want. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God is prepared to do every good work. That's what I really want. This happens to be the issue that God forced my hand on 20-some years ago, and I had to look at this issue and look at all Scripture. But honestly, if I'm fair to myself and honest, this was the first issue I did that for, that I had the guts and time and energy to look through it. And that's why I love our church, because our value is that. Above all of those values is that all Scripture is God-breathed. And that we will hold up this text week in and week out, preaching through whole books of the Bible, looking at the tricky and tough stuff together in community, and following it. Just like we sang, if you said it, I'll believe it. That's what we do here. And this issue is important to me. But the broader issue, the more important issue is that all Scripture is God-breathed.